And today we want to do something a little bit different because we're here at the World Cup, right? And a lot has happened over the last cycle when it comes to soccer and in particular when it comes to tournament play, which is one of the places where we kind of looked for context. And we have been fortunate enough to cover a lot of these tournaments. And what we wanted to kind of do is just give you a real kick, quick rundown and a look back over the last four years as to where we were and how we got to be sitting here in Doha getting ready for the World Cup to kick off. All right, let's start back in 2018, Mossy. Um, we remember that France won the World Cup. What people sometimes forget is that coming into the World Cup, yes, France was a good team, I think for, by some look, recognized as a potentially elite team. But they came in and they barnstormed. They came in and they turned everybody's head and when that started to happen, not only was the team looked at it in a different way, but individual players were looked at in a different way, including, and not the least of which, is Kylian Mbappe, who, who wasn't unknown by any stretch of the imagination, but really cemented his international stardom with what happened. Ultimately winning in that final uh, over Croatia, which was a surprise in, a, uh, in and of itself, and we find ourselves four years later now looking at these returning champions and seeing whether they are going to do it. But in that moment, in that time, there was the ooh and ah factor about that France team. Yeah, Mbappe scored four goals. Um, the only teenager who ever scored more in a single World Cup was Pele when he got six in 1958. So incredible breakout performance. And I'm very curious to see what he does in this tournament now as an established star. All right, well, let's fast forward then to 2029. The Gold Cup, which is always, you know, such a litmus test when it comes to CONCACAF, and in particular for Mexico and the U.S. as they go back and forth. The Gold Cup happened in 2019. Mexico, at that point, topping the United States. That final was held in Chicago on a 1-0 scoreline there. And after that moment... Because being in, in, the, in a Gold Cup final with the United States and Mexico isn't necessarily something that is surprising. It happens, and it happens more often than you would think. But losing to Mexico and obviously coming off of not qualifying for the World Cup and kind of hoping to see a resurrection of the team, that wasn't a great feeling in that moment. It, come, it came to change later on, but in that moment, losing to Mexico, I think a lot of people were looking around saying, are we heading in the right direction, or are we continue, continuing to head in the wrong direction? Yeah, you might recall uh, the summer of 2019 was jam-packed, much to Grant Wall's chagrin. He felt like the deck should have been cleared for the Women's World Cup. We were in France covering that tournament, but you also had the Gold Cup going on at the same time. And actually, just a few hours after the U.S. women won the World Cup, beating the Netherlands in a final, that's when this Gold Cup final took place in Chicago. And you're right, Mexico won 1-0, and what a different time. Tata Martino had gotten off to a great start. U.S. fans were pining for him and ripping on Greg Berhalter. And and uh, this game was, was held up as evidence that the U.S. should have hired Tata instead. And obviously his time uh, with Mexico has turned sour, so nobody's saying that now necessarily. Uh, but, yeah, memorable game, Mexico coming out on top. Well, notwithstanding what Grant uh, wants uh, for this summer, there was still plenty of action uh, out there, including uh, the introduction that year of the Nations League. Now, this was a concept that was created to give, me, give games more meaning, give, make more competitive games. In this day and age of you know, constant friendlies, there was a real desire from confederations uh, to put together tournaments that pitted teams in a way that ultimately the teams cared, but also the fans cared. And I think that it really kind of opened everybody's eyes. England, our friends from England, actually had a really impressive showing in that First Nations League, finishing third. But ultimately, it was Cristiano Ronaldo and Portugal snagging the trophy over the Netherlands, one nothing. And not only in that moment winning a trophy, but I think really kind of stamping the arrival and the approval of what the Nations League or the concept of the Nations League wanted to be. Yeah, it was a good idea by UEFA. It's been a big success. That tournament's had a lot of juice. Um, and, you know, we talk about why would Fernando Santos stay loyal to Cristiano Ronaldo. It's because of the kind of performance that he produced in the semifinals of this uh, Nations League. He scored a hat-trick against Switzerland, three incredible goals. I think one of his best ever games for Portugal. Um, and then ultimately they won uh, the final against the Netherlands. So, yeah, very good first edition of the Nations League, which culminated with Ronaldo and Portugal lifting the trophy. 
Now, look, I love me a Copa America. We never know when, I, when it's actually going to happen. It's, uh, you know, Centenario, it happens, it happens every year, every couple years, whatever. But it doesn't really matter because if there is a Copa America, I'm in, I am there for it. And this was no different in 2019 Copa America. Your Brazil gives you another opportunity to talk about Brazil here. Topped Peru in the final. Argentina, incidentally, uh, finished third. But as we will see coming up, they also found a way to get uh, get their revenge. But in that moment in 2019, it was all about Brazil. Happy days are here. We're heading towards the World Cup in a few years with this, uh, with this team. Can you hearken back and remember how the sentiment was at that time when Brazil won the uh, Copa America in I 2019? I remember exactly. Um, as I mentioned, we were in France covering the Women's World Cup. As soon as our coverage of the final ended, you guys all went to a bar to celebrate. <laughs> I rushed back to my hotel to watch this Copa America final. Brazil beat Peru 3-1 at the Maracanã. Brazil, mind you, um, beat Argentina 2-0 in the semifinals, a very controversial match. Messi was unhappy with the officiating. He went on a rant afterwards, got himself suspended. But that whole incident had a galvanizing effect that... I think really set Argentina off on their run. That semifinal defeat to Brazil is the last game they've lost. They're 36 unbeaten since then, one shy of the international record held by Italy. They're probably going to break that in this World Cup. So, yes, Brazil won, but uh, Argentina took some good things out of that tournament as well. That was when Scaloni really asserted himself, and, and Messi really seemed to buy into him, and he endeared himself to the whole group. And so, uh, the interesting sort of the reverberations from that tournament. All right, last one, and certainly not least, because we look at these tournaments as context for a lot of stuff that we talk about when it comes to the World Cup. The Asian Cup in 2019, and why do we talk about that? Well, it featured none other than Qatar, the host nation, and not only featured them, but ultimately they went on a magical run. They ultimately beat Japan uh, in the final to, to win their first major international trophy behind a lot of the players that we are going to see. We were recording this on a Saturday. We are going to see tomorrow on Sunday as Qatar takes on... Uh, takes on Ecuador. So that was, you know, that was a really impressive moment in this trajectory of what Qatar is. And we know that they have gone out of their way to play as many different games, as many different types of competitions, as many different tournament situations that they could uh, that they could get into while still doing what they needed to do at home. But this was a big moment for the country because it kind of it it, it clarified and uh, put the stamp on what their trajectory was and what that pathway was in that they were heading in the right direction. Yeah, this was the first time that Akram Afif and Amwez Ali hit my radar because they were both sensational in this tournament. Afif ended up winning 2019 Asian Footballer of the Year, and those are the two guys are really going to be counting on at this World Cup. So that was kind of a coming out party for them at the international level. Yeah, great triumph for Qatar, and obviously they hope for more success uh, at home here. All right, well, listen, then we get to 2020, and we all know that our world completely changed both on and off the soccer field with, uh, with COVID. The Euros get delayed, Nations League, it did get underway, but let's be honest, it was such a strange um, and horrible year. Let's, uh, you know, call it, what it, call it what it is. We had, you know, these, these stark, empty, soulless types of games without fans. They were sterile in terms of the environment, but... We were just throwing stuff against the wall, trying to figure out anything that we possibly could to get our uh, to get our soccer fix in the midst of a pandemic. Uh, less said about 2020, the better. Come into 2021, Nations League, as we mentioned, France ultimately becomes champions with a win over Spain in the final two to one. Italy, incidentally, takes third but ultimately misses out on the World Cup. So the return of the Nations League continues on with some really, really good games and some fun, entertaining, and most importantly, competitive types of games. Yeah, this Final Four was incredible. All the games, Spain beat Italy in one semifinal. That's what snapped Italy's 37-match unbeaten run, a record that I think Argentina is going to break at this World Cup. And then France rallied to beat Belgium in the other semifinal, and then ultimately France beat Spain in the final. And France, remember, they, they struggled at the Euros, which we'll get to in a minute. Uh, but this was an example of where the Mbappe-Benzema partnership can work, the way they played in these two games in the final four of this Nations League. So that's a scary proposition for everybody at this World Cup. Those two have shown that they can click together and, and be very good. This was also a point where I think the narrative when it comes to the U.S. men's national team started to change. Obviously, in the midst of qualifying, um, another Gold Cup final, uh, Nations League, all of this type of stuff was going on. And the positive uh, and, and 
I wasn't cautiously optimistic. I think the optimism really started to change, including that uh, Gold Cup final. Made me weep on the sidelines for a number of different reasons, not the least of which is that we had kind of come out of that COVID bubble that we were in, and I saw my U.S. team doing great things, and in particular against Mexico, anytime that happens. Uh, so in general, and I know we focused on the uh, the Gold Cup here, but there was a lot to be excited about and happy about when it came to 2021 and this U.S. men's national team. Yeah, 2021 was a summer when all this U.S. promise went from theory to practice. We actually got to see it on the field. They won two trophies, beating Mexico in both finals. They used the quote-unquote A-team in the Nations League, beat Mexico 3-2 in extra time, Pulisic with a late penalty. Remember Ethan Horvath coming yep. off the bench to be a hero. And then right afterwards, the Gold Cup, where they used their quote-unquote B-team, although you bristle at that designation. Yeah. Um, that team had more of an underdog kind of identity. They were able to sort of grind their way through that tournament, a lot of one nils, including in the final and extra time against Mexico, Miles Robinson uh, with the goal in Las Vegas. It brought you to tears. And yeah, so that, that was an incredible summer that really launched this U.S. national team under Greg Berhalter. All right, well, you mentioned the Euros. Uh, they were finally played. And when they were, it was an incredibly exciting uh, tournament. England, it was coming home. Everybody thought it was coming home. Ultimately, it didn't quite come home at the end. They weren't able to beat Italy. They lost to them in uh, penalties in the final. I guess they got the last laugh ultimately because England is going to the World Cup and our friends the Azzurri for the second time in a row are not going to, uh, to the World Cup. Thoughts on the Euros? I know that uh, Warren Barton, Kelly Smith, Annie Aluko, Kate Abdo, we have a lot of English people know. In, our, in our crew. Too many, way too many. Um, I know they don't want to hear this, but... Boy, for a team that wasn't the quote-unquote host of a tournament, they got to play a whole lot of home games, uh, which I think really facilitated this run to the final for them. And they got to play at Wembley in the final against Italy and scored after just two minutes with Luke Shaw. So you thought this was it. It's finally coming home. And then, of course, England allowed Italy to equalize and ultimately lost some penalties, so heartbreak for them. But... Um, what Garrett Sa Southgate backers are pointing out is that in the two major tournaments he's managed, they've gone very far. They got to the semifinals of the last World Cup and the final of the Euros. So although they've had a terrible performance in this most recent Nations League, England fans are hoping that uh, they bring their major tournament form under Southgate into this World Cup. In, in a different world, uh, Gareth Southgate is knighted. I mean, <laughs> you know, I mean for, for what he's doing, but this is England, and uh, that's not how it works. All right, now we get to some interesting stuff when it comes to Copa America. Again, love me some Copa America. This is a moment that does provide context for what we're about to talk about here for the next month when it comes to Messi and Argentina, because this was a checking of the box when Argentina not only won, but won against their biggest South American rival in Brazil and in the Maracanã. That was a, a huge box to check. You saw in that final moment when the whistle blew how important it was to Messi and how important it was to his teammates to kind of give him this because it is something that, has been, that he has been chasing. Now, does that mean that the constant compare and contrast between Diego Mar Maradona is going to stop? No, because Diego won a World Cup. But it does give him, I think, a a warmth and a confidence going into this World Cup. But it had to hurt, my friend, to have Argentina come into the Maracanã and in that final of the, uh, the Copa America, take it right out of your jaws. Yeah, remember, this tournament was originally going to be co-hosted by Argentina and Colombia, and then those two countries backed out because of COVID. Brazil stepped in at the last minute, so it was a little bit odd to, two years later, have another Copa America in Brazil. Brazil were the big favorites. But Argentina came out on top in that final one. Di Maria with the goal. And, yeah, I think they've taken a lot of confidence out of that, and which could carry over into this World Cup. Keep in mind, though, there were some positives for Brazil because uh, that defeat to Argentina is what prompted Chichi to realize that he needed to add more spark to the attack. Um, Brazil, the first three years of this cycle, we were kind of a plotting team that wasn't all that exciting to watch. But since then, Vinicius Jr. has emerged, players like Rafinha, Anthony, Rodrigo, Martinelli even got into the squad. And so it's given the team a whole different flavor, a lot of young, explosive, dynamic legs in that attack. Um, so yeah, obviously, Argentina took major positives out of it. But I think if Brazil ends up winning this World Cup, ultimately, we might look at that Copa America final defeat as a bit of an inflection point as well. OK, all right. Again, context. Uh, so the Olympics were pushed back, too. We finally get the Olympics. and from a Brazilian standpoint, it went well. Brazil winning gold, topping Spain for in that gold medal game 2-1, to one, and Mexico doing well too, beating Japan for the bronze. 
Yeah, this softened the blow a little bit from Brazil losing the Copa America a few weeks later, winning their second straight Olympic gold medal, beating Spain in the final. And there were some players that used this tournament as a springboard to the senior team that are here at this World Cup, players like Anthony and Bruno Guimarães. Brazil take the Olympics very seriously, more so than most countries. And so if you do well for Brazil in that tournament, you generally find yourself into the next senior squads. I know you're somebody that agrees with how Brazil treats it and doesn't understand why other countries don't value the Olympics as much. Yeah, I mean, I just think that we have very few opportunities to put players in environments that are going to test them, that are going to, to use a Jurgen Klinsmann phrase, put them out of their comfort zone, or are going to blood them for the tournaments. And the tournament we're talking about ultimately is the World Cup. And I know the Olympics aren't necessarily the World Cup, but it's kind of the next best thing, and especially for younger players. And I just look back, I know that I benefited from 1992, and I could not have had the 94 success without also playing in, and going through a, uh, an Olympic process in 1992. And as we know, for multiple cycles now, the U.S. has wasted that opportunity and that platform. Let's, let's be thankful that we're finally going back to the next uh, Olympics and we can use that platform to get some players. Who, who knows? We may be talking about in a very different way or just even talking about come 2026. Uh, all right, so we uh, spin it forward to 2022. And I think we're going to go right to Africa Cup of Nations. This is very, very important, and this is kind of timely right now because all of the talk about Senegal, and there's a lot of people out there that are talking about Senegal as their dark horse type of team. But a lot of the talk about Senegal is because of you know, both of the wins that they had ultimately against Egypt. One was the African Cup of Nations, and then they doubled down in terms of beating Egypt and Mo Salah to go to the World Cup. A big, big year, strange year, uh, as you uh, had mentioned to me before off air, uh, because, you know, Senegal actually plays two major tournaments in one year. But, you know, this is 2022. Anything can happen. We do some, uh, we do some strange things. And it's important because Sadio Mane, we find out, is now not going to be playing in the tournament because of an injury. That is a huge, huge loss for the tournament in general, but it's also a huge, huge loss for this Senegal team. And I think it changes the conversation when it comes to who – you others are uh, think are going through in that uh, in that group A. Yeah, very disappointing. I drove past a big Sadio Mane billboard here the other day, and uh, yeah, to have him not be able to push on all the great things he's done, African Player of the Year, runner-up in the Ballon d'Or, and to be able to represent his country at the World Cup is disappointing. Uh, but he did lead them earlier this year to their first Africa Cup of Nations title, as you mentioned, beating Egypt there. Also got the better of Egypt and Mosul in qualifying, which made things very awkward in that Liverpool dressing room, by the way. Klopp has talked about how he couldn't congratulate Mane too loudly if Salah was uh, close by. So... Uh, but nevertheless, yeah, this was a, a great triumph for them, and we'll see what they can do at this World Cup without Sadio Mane. All right, well, this has been everything that you need to know, and we only wanted to do this because I think it is important to just remind ourselves, and whether it's us or the people that are watching or the people that are listening, to remind ourselves of how much has happened over this last cycle and how much of that can actually inform some of the stuff that we are seeing. And you heard Mossy talk about Brazil and the way that they used either the wins or the defeats in tournaments like uh, Copa America or the United States. Greg Berhalter absolutely will be informed by some of the things that he saw in the Nations League, in the Gold Cup, obviously in uh, World, Cup, uh, World Cup qualifying. And yes, we're going to talk about the whistle is going to blow and the games are going to happen and the context is going to become what happened in the previous game here in the World Cup. But everything that you see on that field it has roots. It has tentacles that stretch back. And sometimes we forget with so much soccer that happens day in and day out, month in and, and year out, sometimes we forget all of the different things uh, that we had. So we just wanted to go back and check that out for, uh, for, for you and for us, let's, uh, let, let's be honest. All right, Mossy, anything before we go? That's it. My man, you look great, and uh, you are doing a wonderful job. This man right here, ladies and gentlemen, is working his ass off, okay, as are all incredible men and women in front of the camera, behind the camera, to get us set for what is going to be an absolute blowout of a tournament from a Fox perspective. I mentioned the incredible set that we have here. It is unlike anything that you have ever seen, and it's not just about bells and whistles. It augments uh, an incredible group of talent that we have, bringing it to you day in and day out. I'll be honest, I live for this. 
this is, I could not be happier. I'm a pig and you know what. And I am rolling around in the World Cup. You smell that? That's a World Cup. And there's nothing like it, my friends. All right. We will see you next time right here on the State of the Union podcast. And until then, and as always, size the day. Goodbye from Doha.